So um, Professor Gumbel is a, new, uh, is a new associate professor in ethnic studies at Delta College. Before coming to Delta College, um, Professor Gumbel taught various Asian American studies departments at San Francisco State University and City College of San Francisco for the past five years. The course that, taught, uh, uh, that, that he taught includes um, Asian American institutions and ideals, Asian American activism, and um, Asian American pop culture. Um, in addition, uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Gumbel um, is the eldest son of Filipino immigrant um, family searching for the American dream and settled in Northern California um, and residing in San Jose and our very own Sacramento. Before receiving his master's degree in Asian American studies at San Francisco State University, Professor Gumbel took classes at our sister college, Sacramento City College. But we'll not, we won't tell him which one which college is better, right? Of course, it's CRC. <laughs> um, besides teaching, Professor Gumbel is an organizer in the Filipino American community um, around local issues of immigration and workers' rights um, and human rights um, issues in the Philippines. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Eugene Gumbel. Thank you, Raul. Um, I'm honored to be here. I wish I was in person with most with all of you. Um, it's been a while since I've been at Consumers River College, and I know there's been a lot of changes the last, ooh, I don't want to date myself, but 25 years. Oh my goodness. Um, so thank you again for inviting me to this wonderful event. Um, it's kind of like a homecoming for me. Uh, in terms of supporting uh, all that great work that's happening in Sacramento at Consumers River College in celebration of Filipino American History Month. So, um, yes, Lynn, can I share my PowerPoint? Yes. All right. So, you all see my screen without the notes? I'm hoping. Um, Let's see, oh, logistics. Yes, Dr. Okay, cool. So happy Filipino American History Month. Um, I wanna start off our conversation with um, obviously uh, a quote from Manang or uh, from Dr. Uh, Don Mabalon. Um, she uh, was a very important and influential person for me uh, throughout my life. Um, I'll speak to kind of how I know her um, through my, my story um, in terms of getting involved in the community. And um, she is, uh, she recently passed away uh, in 2018. Um, and she was a professor, a history professor at San Francisco State University and one of the board of trustees of the Filipino American National Historical Society. So um, she was key in terms of the work that they were doing uh, in advocating for what we now know as Filipino American National Philippine American History Month. So, uh, so this is a quote from Don. History is inclusive of heritage and culture, but it's also about the ways we have built and changed this nation. Our stories, political struggles, transformations, labor, migration, activism, impact of imperialism and war, uh, victories, etc. Whereas heritage is more limited to what we pass down in terms of culture, tradition, and legacies. History is inclusive of heritage and much more. We made history, we helped build this nation. That's what this month is about. And I think uh, she is um, speaking to this idea of history versus heritage. Um, which the reason why uh, we have a long history here in the United States uh, as Filipino Americans, and we've contributed to so much in to the development of this wonderful country that we now kind of live in. Um, and it's not just about eating lumpia, but what does it mean to kind of understand the social, political, um, and historical context of why we're here in the United States. So um, again, thank you um, for inviting me. I am, or my name is Eugene Gamble. Um, I just wanted to share with you my immigration story here to the United States. Um, so my parents are, uh, they, are from two parts of the Philippines. My dad is from Pangasinan. Um, anybody from the northern part of the Philippines in this class, or sorry, in this <laughs> Zoom session. Um, and my mom is from Capiz, which is the Sayas, the middle uh, regions of the Philippines. Um, I was born here 
uh, in Chicago, Illinois. Um, but I grew up in San Jose and Sacramento. So um, my parents came here uh, uh, to find better opportunities for our family, uh, which is kind of a common narrative for many Filipino Americans uh, in their migration story. Uh, my father's family uh, were farmers back in Pangasinan. And my mom's um, family owned a little uh, grocery store or what we could would call like a tindara, tindara, tindara han, sorry. I'm, I'm still trying to practice my Tagalog because I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't taught Tagalog when I was young. So I'm trying to uh, push myself to learn it. Um, so they came here obviously um, for this idea of the American dream as many people have kind of shared, not just Filipino Americans, but other immigrants that come here. And I think um, with that kind of uh, influenced how I was raised, how I grew up, um, and how they emphasize this idea of education, um, that it was so hard uh, finding a job in the Philippines. Um, and my parents had to go to college and come here uh, in the 70s to make a better life for their family. And uh, as they made it here, they were able to support the family back home in the Philippines. So um, I grew up in Sacramento uh, most of my life. Um, I was only in short stints uh, in San Jose and Sacramento, uh, San Jose and Chicago. Um, I went to Christian Brothers High School. Um, it's a private school. Some of y'all know that. Um, I went. I was. Um, what do you call? I would say I grew up in like a working class background. Um, normal teenage life, trying to do sports, trying to hang out with friends. Um, and I think I didn't know much, more, not much about my culture or my history as a Filipino American um, in those, I guess, stages of my life. Not, not until I kind of went to uh, Sacramento City College is where I was introduced to um, Asian American Studies and Filipino American Studies courses. So uh, I had the support from who did I have? Professor uh, Mark Fabinar um, and the counselor, her, his mother, uh, Maria Fabinar. Um, and they were pivotal in terms of getting me involved in my community. Um, and I was able to, uh, with other students, start a student organization at Sacramento City College and advocate for uh, Filipino language courses. So um, that's a little about my, my history of why I got involved. Um, in the midst of trying to do pre-med and pre-engineering, um, like many students do, uh, or Filipino American students, um, I kind of changed my career path as a result of all the, the wonderful work that um, uh, Asian American Studies and Filipino American Studies is doing. So I eventually transferred out of Sacramento City College and went to UC Irvine. Um, and I was able to study abroad in the Philippines for a whole year. So. Um, trying to connect to my roots was important to me. Um, and now um, I was able to then attend uh, SF State for my master's in Asian American studies. And um, I was able to teach there the last five years, uh, which was uh, a very great experience. I think uh, learning from the OGs of, of, those, of those departments was important um, as if they play a major role in a lot of the the ethnic studies movement back in the day. So, um, and now I'm associate professor of ethnic studies at San Joaquin Delta College. So that's a little about myself. Um, uh, and that's kind of how I wanna frame our conversation today um, in terms of learning about our history, finding about our roots and how to get involved and be active in our communities. So, um, so, um, where's my? Okay, sorry, um, I got multiple screens going on. So today's theme I um, that I'm focusing on for my presentation is making waves. And I think this is appropriate in terms of uh, the celebration and legacy of uh, the Philippine American History Month, um, where um, they have taught us that there's seven different waves of Filipino immigration here to the, this country. So um, I'll kind of brush over that, but I'll kind of tie in my own personal experience and what that means in terms of um, the bigger picture of the work that I'm doing. Um, so these waves, um, they, waves travel on the surface of the ocean. You can see and feel their energy. Underneath the surface is where teaching happens. 
And when the water is in conversation with the wind, they give birth to generations of waves. Also, when you connect with the water, you can even initiate your own wave. So I wanna use this metaphor today to kind of engage our understanding, our, our conversation around Filipino American history. Um, so I was able to collaborate with my mentor, colleague, friend, uh, Professor Tintion Kukubala. She teaches at SF State and also part of the Pinoy Educational Partnerships. And um, this is a quote from her uh, that I thought was uh, useful and helpful. Like our ancestors, we navigate life, use our personal compasses, stars, and institutions to find our way. We circumvent obstructions and obstacles often created by systems and institutions that are not meant for our humanity. And we ride the waves with the strongest bangka or boat in Tagalog that we have ourselves. And we ride collectively. We are each other's authors. We become barangays. And I think this is important to kind of uh, frame this idea of wave or metaphor. Um, so wonder, uh, what are we wondering about Philippine American History Month? What do you know? Um, what would you like to learn more about? Um, and what is the context or what happened um, to uh, these various waves of immigration? Uh, what were the systems that impacted our experiences um, at that time? And what was the journey that we took? Uh, what stories came out of those experiences? And what, um, uh, what are the counter stories that are necessarily talked about um, in American history? And uh, finally, empathize. How do we kind of connect it to ourselves? How does this wave relate to our own family's experience? And I think um, ethnic studies and Asian American studies is uh, important to kind of understand who we are uh, per, um, as individuals and in, in relation to our own communities. So I think um, ethnic studies has been a pivotal role in kind of understanding myself um, and, and understanding my own community as it was oftentimes um, not talked about or forgotten as I grew up. Um, so these are the seven waves that Fonz has kind of um, uh, proposed um, in terms of the, the seven waves of immigration. Um, I just want folks to kind of look at the eras. Um, we see an era of a time where this country wasn't even a country yet, it wasn't US. So we as Filipinos have been here for a long time. And then the preceding or the succeeding uh, periods of time, we see different uh, populations of Filipinos coming here uh, as a result of the relationship with the United States. And that plays a key role in how we kind of understand um, why our community is the way that it is today. So um, I'll go over these seven waves. Um, so as early as 1587, we were here in this, I guess, continent uh, that we call now called the United States. So on October 18th, 1587, first Filipinos landed Morro Bay, California. They arrived aboard the Nuestra Senora de Bueno Esperanza as part of the Man Manila galleon trade and established a fishing village and created a community in St. Malo in Louisiana. So again, uh, we as Filipino American uh, should kind of understand that our history um, goes a long way back. And uh, why don't we hear about this history? Um, so the second wave um, is during uh, American colonization. So um, the Philippines was colonized by Spain for about 300 years and about 50 years uh, under American uh, colonization. And as a result of um, us as being a territory of the United States, um, and you not, um, Filipino immigrants were able to come here to, the, to this country to become students at American universities. Uh, they came here to kind of learn about uh, American democracy, US government, and um, the intention was to kind of bring that back to um, the Philippines um, to kind of, uh, educate um, folks back there. The third wave um, is the, the wave of our manongs. Um, these are about 100,000 of Filipino, Filipinos, uh, males coming here from 
predominantly uh, Pungas, or the Ilocos region or the Ilocano region. Um, and they worked in various parts of this country, um, up in uh, Hawaii in the canneries. They worked in the Central Valley uh, along and also um, in Hawaii as uh, cicadas. And um, my family on my dad's side was, uh, my Lolo was here in the early 1900s working those fields, the Hawaiian plantations back in the day. And um, I have family members still living in Hawaii. So um, my family history is rooted in this particular period of uh, having this opportunity uh, to find this American dream. Um, and um, because they were US nationals of, at that time, which meant that um, they uh, were able to come to the country without, I guess, the rights of uh, American citizens. And then the fourth wave um, is the exclusion period. Uh, this is pre-World War II. Uh, as Filipino Americans established communities here, uh, they faced a lot of racial discrimination. And I think uh, as US nationals, they were necessarily considered citizens. So they didn't necessarily have the, the rights to vote and own land at the time. Uh, but they also had this kind of ambiguous situation where um, they weren't necessarily aliens to this country. And um, as a result, uh, they had to prove themselves as Americans here. And they served in the first and second infantry uh, during World War II. Um, and we see that um, because of their service, uh, about 11,000 Filipinos um, were able to gain citizenship as a result of fighting for uh, the United States, uh, but also defending um, against Japanese colonization in the Philippines. And they were able to become naturalized citizens as a result of the Lucella Act of 1946. So uh, this is the first uh, kind of moment where we could see how um, Filipinos are proving themselves as Americans and are now able to kind of gain that, the rights and privileges of that. Um, and then the sixth wave um, is where an influx of immigrants were, uh, were escaping um, the, the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines. Uh, so there was a lot of political and social turmoil at the time. Um, and also the, the laws at that time here in, in the United States changed where it was opened up for um, young professionals and people to um, sponsor their family members to come here the United States. So we see a large um, influx of Filipino American professionals uh, as a result of the 1965 Immigration Act. And um, my parents were able to take advantage of that as they went to college back in the Philippines and now are um, accountants. And my dad's an accountant, and my mom's a nurse at this moment. So um, yeah. And then finally, the last wave, um, we see uh, 1986 to the present, which is my generation, uh, second and third. Uh, these are folks who are born here in the United States, um, grew, who have kind of established their sense of community and history um, the last couple of decades. And I think um, this diasporic kind of uh, nature of Philippine migration, which is the largest number of immigrants from the Philippines, um, and the fourth largest origin group from Mexico, India, and China. Um, so we've, as a community, have been here for, for a while. And as a community, we've kind of struggled through a lot of different challenges. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to our resiliency and um, our determination um, to support our families and um, ensure that our, we have a future here in this country. And um, as a result, um, we still kind of suffer from a lot of those challenges. Um, we suffer from high rates of HIV, AIDS, uh, poverty, gang violence, and also, um, although we experience um, upward mobility in terms of um, our education, there's also this occupational downgrading um, in our community. So, um, questions? I know I've been talking for a while. Uh, I want to make sure everyone's okay. Okay. Um, so 
Raul asked me to talk about this idea of the model minority myth in our community. And I'm going to refer to this article, Philippine American, the Model Minority by Kevin Nadal, who's a professor in psychology at CUNY, which is in New York. And um, the model minority myth defines all Asian Americans as being well-educated, successful, career-driven, and law-abiding citizens in the United States as compared to racial ethnic minority groups such as African Americans and Latinos. Uh, the notion of model minority is based on the census data and other demographic statistics that indicate that Asian Americans achieve higher levels of education and household incomes uh, than whites and other groups of color. So um, as we think about um, our own communities, um, uh, we have to kind of unpack the complexities of the situation. There's Filipinos who, are, who do well, who are nurses, who are doctors, who are engineers, but our, our communities, also, not all of our community is succeeding in the same way. And many of us um, students that I've kind of engaged with um, have had challenges uh, in college, uh, kind of completing um, their degrees due to all the different things that are happening at the home in a and in their communities. And I think, um, this is kind of where I'm speaking to uh, and how we're going to debunk this myth of the model minority. So uh, the model minority um, is often referred to Asian Americans in terms of, oh, we're the ones who do well in school. We get all straight A's. We get great jobs after we go to college. And um, as a result, we're able to buy homes, nice cars. And this is kind of associated with this idea of the American dream. Um, but we don't, what doesn't necessarily um, come out of that narrative is the challenges that we face um, because this conception that we're doing well um, kind of dismisses the, um, this other part of our community where uh, we're suffering from mental illness, we're suffering from various issues in our community. Um, oh, sorry, I'm looking at the chat box. Yes. Uh, a high rate of HIV is that for Filipino Americans? Yes. So uh, in the reading, uh, it speaks to how our Filipino American, Filipino X LGBT community is uh, impact is one of the highest um, uh, numbers of uh, who suffer from HIV. So um, that's often not talked about in our community um, as because of uh, the stigma of um, LGBTQ issues in our community. Um, and I think going up um, and also going to school um, and having friends that are going through those challenges, they would often speak to the, because of the religious nature of <laughs> our families, um, those issues aren't necessarily put up, uh, discussed like over the dinner table. So um, I want to kind of, kind of flush out um, how all these different things that happen uh, growing up affect us. Um, and I, on the slide, you see uh, as Filipino Americans, second generation students, there's a lot of things that we go through. For example, high school dropout rates and lower education, uh, college graduations, uh, higher prevalence of HIV, adolescent or out of wedlock pregnancy and substance abuse and higher risk and incarceration. So we don't necessarily fall into this um, model minority. Um, we too, as a community are uh, forgotten uh, and invisible uh, when it comes to like support services. Um, uh, when uh, we're in the classroom, uh, teachers might have a bias say, oh, they're doing well, they're doing fine. Not necessarily engaging students and uh, helping them kind of process what's going on in terms of some of these issues. And um, I want to kind of think about um, in this conversation, uh, how that plays out at uh, CRC. Um, what are the issues at um, CRC that students are facing at this moment? Um, uh, so in the Zoom chat, um, I wanna kind of learn from y'all. Um, what is happening among students in, on your campus? Uh, what are the issues amongst the peers? Um, is it similar to um, attaining um, an AA degree? Is it uh, similar to um, mental health issues. Uh, so in the Zoom chat real quick, what are things that are prevalent that's happening on your campus? 
what this looks like. 30 seconds. No. Thoughts. No examples. Oh. Um, maybe this will help. Oh, here we go. Peers with a need for mental health resources and encouragement to pursue them. Thank you, Monica. I appreciate your um, example. I think mental health has been a pretty significant issue um, the last five years teaching at SF State and City College of San Francisco. Um, students for sure have kind of approached me with many different challenges. And I think under COVID, um, it for sure brought out all those different issues to the forefront of our, um, for the faculty and staff. And I think um, there's a stigma in our community where some of these things aren't necessarily talked about. Um, I know in my family, folk, my family are like, it doesn't exist in their head and or it's like, uh, suck it up kind of deal. So we're not gonna address it. It's just something you just have to go through. Um, and I think growing up in six, at Sac City, uh, we had similar issues too that this generation too is facing. Um, what else? Mental health, I've noticed. Jose, Geraldine, I see more females than males going to college. And why is that the case? Um, I think um, there are challenges for Filipino males and trying to kind of even go to school, especially in the second generation, as um, many face like um, criminalization or getting, just getting caught up in being a teenager, um, where education is not necessarily like on the priority list. And I think that's it's a long, long uh, conversation to, to have. Adolescent pregnancy for Galilea. Um, challenges of being a first generation at college students, and that's very important. So um, I think for myself, I'm a first generation also. Uh, it, my parents aren't, they didn't, they, know what, they didn't know what to do to support me here at Sacramento City College since they went to school back home in the Philippines. And I think that kind of uh, made it more difficult for me to kind of get adapted to the resources, the culture of being in college here. And I think that can kind of contribute to like the challenges for us. Um, and then time check. So, um, I think that there can be that, oh, sorry. It's like all the chats are dropping in. I think that there can be that of only stress and doing well in school. So the stress to kind of succeed uh, is uh, in our families is, a, uh, is prevalent in a lot of Filipino American students. Um, they want you to kind of be financially stable. Um, they want you to kind of succeed uh, in this American dream. Um, pressure to conform to the model minority and become a doctor. Yes, Winnie. Um, I think that's a stereotype that all Filipinos are nurses and or doctors um, or in some medical kind of capacity. And I think that's kind of a learned uh, value throughout the generation of, um, it became a, a way out for a lot of Filipinos to come here to the United States. And it kind of passed on to the next generation. They're like, oh, this is a stable job. Uh, you'll be happy. And they push their children to kind of, um, to attain these type of uh, careers. And I think um, it kind of prevents Filipino Americans to kind of try other careers out there that they could be successful and be happy with. And I think, uh, that's part of college. Um, a lot of folks of us are trying to figure out who we are as people, uh, what our careers are going to be. And I think um, it will take time. Uh, it will take that support network and your community college to help you uh, and guide you through that process. And um, I think um, understanding that and being okay with that um, could kind of um, Kind of speaks to what our community is all about. So, um, pressure to choose STEM major. So, it looks like everyone wants to be a STEM major um, in this group, or not everyone, but 
it's encouraged too. So thank you for those who shared. Um, and it kind of gave me a sense of what CRC is about. And surprise, surprise, um, it looks like the sciences is one of the top majors uh, or careers that folks want to kind of pursue. Uh, business is on the top one of the top ones to liberal arts, biology. Um, so we can see that um, Philippine American students are kind of gravitating towards um, these kind of traditional kind of fields. And I think um, that could speak to maybe some of the challenges for us here at the community college level as um, this might not necessarily be the, the career fit for some students. Um, and seven minutes. Um, so I want to kind of transition to this activity. Um, you see a, a picture, a political cartoon of the late 1800s. Um, and I want folks in the Zoom chat to kind of look over the political cartoon. And how is education represented in this cartoon? So in the Zoom chat, feel free to kind of one word describe what's happening or what you're feeling from this cartoon. <clears throat> this looks like 15 seconds. What is happening? What do you think is happening? What do you observe? Who are the main characters in this cartoon that kind of stick out to you? What is, who is the Filipino in this picture? What do folks know about? Observe. And then we'll end this presentation with the conversation. So first glance, what do folks see? What's happening with the teacher? Who is the teacher? Who are the students? Is there different students in this? What are they doing? Okay. Sarah, um, the students that aren't from the state seem to be learning in fear and the teacher looks intimidating as the students in the back are from the states and they seem to be learning peacefully and unbothered. Thank you, Sarah. Sabrina, I know when Karen that these children are singled out and scolded. Uh, colonialism and education and punishment of brown students in their homeland. So um, you guys, or you folks are um, picking out some very important things. Um, and this is speaks to our history as Filipino Americans um, and how we as a community have learned this idea of the American dream. Uh, it didn't come from uh, this like, friendly um, relationship, but a lot of it was like of fear and intimidation uh, as colonization has kind of um, changed our his history as a country. And that has contributed to why uh, we as Filipino Americans, second, third, and other generations might not necessarily know our history as a result of um, a history that has been violent, a uh, history that kind of um, has dismissed or forgotten our experiences as, as Filipino Americans. And I think um, this American dream um, that was taught to us uh, a long time ago under uh, the Thomasites, um, where American teachers uh, were in the Philippines teaching us about, A is for Apple, where- One moment. Uh, and where, we were learning about snow with the Philippines Still on about it. snow. And I think um, with this type of colonial education, it for sure has impacted the ways we see our own um, history. And um, living here in the United States, um, experiencing all the different discrimination um, throughout the different eras, and always trying to kind of fight for our kind of role and our representation in this country we see that um, although um, we were, our history was necessarily taught to us, uh, folks have um, 
uh, continue that legacy and that struggle to celebrate our contributions here in this country. Uh, and I think um, with that, um, we're celebrating 50 years of Philippine American studies, um, 40 years of the Philippine American National Historical Society, and 30 years of this Philippine American History Month. And I think as we recognize, it took almost 50 years to kind of be at this place. It took a lot of hard work and sacrifice of folks in our community, uh, especially students who've uh, been in, uh, played major roles in a lot of these different movements. Um, we see our history and representation uh, kind of coming to fruition. Um, and we see even more of our um, brothers, our Filipino brothers and sisters um, in different spaces, politically, socially, and economically, where um, I think this is our time in terms of politics. We see people, like our Attorney General, Rob Bonta. We see folks in entertainment, uh, in movies. Um, and I think um, this is something that we should be celebrating and, and recognizing the all the different contributions we've had um, in this country. So thank you, everyone. I think that's time. Um, and I think it's Q&A time. <coughs> Am I? Let's stop sharing. What do we do? Next? Thank you so much, Professor Gamble. Um, please help me give Eugene a round of applause for his presentation. This gives us an opportunity now to think about any questions, comments, or clarifications we may have about your presentation. I know for me, it's very, um, very much thought provoking. I feel a little agitated when I see some of that information and then also feel very humbled and inspired and motivated to keep um, highlighting and emphasizing the contributions and the, the history of Filipinos around the world and in particular in our region. So I, I really appreciate your personal perspective having grown up in this community and I haven't had a chance to see you virtually in person. Congratulations on your professorship, on your, on your teaching position at Delta. It's awesome. And I'm so glad we're able to have you here as our, as our guest speaker for the 30th anniversary of FAM and CRC's second annual. And we've got a great group of friends here. So please, any questions or comments you may have in the chat or un unmute and let's um, hear your voice and or um, share your video if you'd like, but no pressure, maybe just a unmute is great or in the chat. M many thank yous are pouring in. Maraming maraming salamat to Mr. Gumbel, Professor Gumbel. Thank you everyone. Yes. Appreciate it. It's great to be here. Um, I wish I was there at Consumers right now. Um, I did take a couple classes there in the early, oh wait, late 90s, wow. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned um, it's probably changed, and it has. And you also shared some data about, you know, aspirations. I think the other important thing to add in the context here, too, that would love to get your thoughts and others' thoughts on this is Raul is our inaugural director of the Anapisi Grant, which is the Asian American, Native American Pacific Islander Serving Institution Grant. So we're also designated as an Anapisi school which is huge, tremendous. We're also a designated HSI and our friends from the HSI grant, Mikasa, are here on the call. And so, you know, you, you mentioned some of the model minority myth and the, the damaging effects of a, what might be perceived as a positive stereotype, which stereotypes in general are not positive, but some call model minority myth a positive stereotype. You know, if you think about the context of Anna PC, also only in his 15th year, right, Raul? Raul's our inaugural director, comes from a background of trio, also a Pinoy Filipinx. That's really symbolic for CRC as well, to have um, a Filipino director of Anna PC, which we call a Pita Hawks, Asian Pacific Islander, Desi American. Holistic, academic, 
holistic achievement with knowledge and service. Thank you. Love the acronyms. Thank you. Yeah, the acronym is awesome. (laughs) And then takes practice similar for Mikasa, our HSI, Mm -hmm. inaugural HSI grant, and our inaugural team, uh, director and team, some are here. You know, so what does that say about the model minority myth in practice when you see Anna PC is 15 years old? Mm-hmm. Um, HSI much longer. Um, you know, the second annual fam. I think I'm, I may be the first executive woman Filipina in CRC's history as well. First Filipina inaugural VP of institutional equity. It's a new role. So, so you can see the youngness of our um, leadership, youngness in that first year, Sabrina Sensel, also inaugural Dean of Research and Equity, Pinay. Uh, our inaugural Ethnic Studies faculty member is on the call. I think I saw Professor Dr. Winnie Hong here a moment ago. Alex Casareño, another um, Pinoy American Indian administrator. I mean, we have, and uh, Professor Faud is here, Kimberly, uh, Filipina scientist so we and there are others that i may not um know personally because i'm i'm fairly new here Mm -hmm. to crc and to the sacramento area by way of portland well by way of virginia and and origins in portland and i think you know what i'm trying to contextualize here professor eugene and you help us unpack this (coughs) model minority myth and its impact on programs and leadership um and and the impact it's had on uh our region although we may be growing in critical mass you know we've, we have generations now filipinos here in sacramento in on the west coast in the country what does that say about our program design our teaching our services our leadership of higher education that's a big question um i'm not sure if you hear my dog which is knocking on the door behind me um tell her hi <laughs> Nara, I mean, uh, bring Nara. Hey, hi, Nara. <laughs> it's a family affair here, Professor. Or presentation. You want to say hi? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an eight-year-old. Um, she, she's a, for sure has her voice. Um, I think I'm trying to unpack the question, but representation, representation sort of broadly. And, and, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. I think speaking towards like even my role or my position uh, at Delta College, um, learning about it took many, many years to kind of even fight for this ethnic studies requirement that has just been recently passed. It's opening up all these different positions for not just Filipino American professors, but other uh, communities of color. And I think, the civil rights movement opened up a lot of doors for, for our communities. But again, um, those institutions at its, at its foundation doesn't necessarily change um, completely. And I think uh, the inequalities that still existed um, of the time still kind of permeate today um, in many different ways. Although a lot of us have kind of positioned ourselves in different roles and fought for certain grants like NFPZ I think, um, and on top of like, oh, this idea of we should become nurses and doctors and engineers, it doesn't necessarily put it, put us in um, a position of like these roles we're, we're teaching uh, about our history, or we're in administration where we're supporting our communities of color of faculty, and I think uh, as we kind of. Um, not to say walk away from the model minority, but as other people take on different roles in our communities um, in different career paths, I think is when um, we'll build that power as a community to uh, fight for programs, uh, fight for faculty and staff, um, where um, we are able to serve our students um, and we could represent uh, similar struggles as our students are going through today. Um, and I think um, <laughs> you, okay. Um, I think uh, as even going through the seven waves of immigration, it it took different periods of up and down 
struggle and overcoming things to kind of obtain citizenship, obtain uh, social economic mobility in this country. And now that we kind of are straying away from the model minority kind of positions, we're able to um, become more uh, comprehensive, I guess, community where we serve all the different needs uh, that haven't necessarily been addressed in the past um, and that we're learning that um, we're, we need to be in those spaces and conversations to ensure that the change does happen um, and that um, these programs are built. So I'm not sure if that answered your question. Oh, that, that's great, Eugene. Thank you so much. I have a follow-up question too. Um, since I don't see any other questions in the chat, but please feel free to put your question or comment in the chat or un, unmute. Um, Eugene, you talked about your early influences and the impact that a faculty member and um, a counselor and faculty member, counseling faculty and their mother, uh, who's also an employee faculty member at Sac City had on your um, awareness and consciousness raising around ethnic studies and just your time as a community college student and, and um, from the Sacramento area. What are some ways students can get involved now and develop agency and um, sort of ta harness the, the power that they have as students at CRC? What, what might be some things that students may want to know about or, or um, be aware of right now as they're, as they're with us? Um... College could be a very difficult place. Um, and I feel like it could be isolating and lonely at times. Um, and finding that support network is important. And I was, uh, I appreciate the counselors and the professors that were there for me. And I think that was the first step for my like consciousness of understanding who I am as a person. Um, sometimes it's like, I'll just work hard, um, put my head and focus on the task at hand or the assignment. And I think that not, that's not a very, very productive kind of process, uh, but working with community, working with other folks is um, like that step to kind of addressing what you're going through with people rather than alone. And um, I think in this space, it sounds like there's these, all these different opportunities. We have now more Filipino American faculty and staff around to kind of share their own experiences um, and help students kind of navigate the challenges of isolation and or kind of like um, just navigating transferring out uh, is a hard thing to do um, with all the different challenges happening at home of, or having with their families. So I think um, this is Filipino American History Month we're in the age of social media, their community is one click away. Um, and I think there's various events that happen at Sacramento. I believe they passed them uh, in Elk Grove, in Laguna, and I believe there's other community spaces um, and leaders out there in Sacramento that still do that, continue that great work. So I encourage folks to kind of reach out to people. I think that's one, one thing. And then try to figure out how do you come up want to contribute um, to what on your campus or in your community. Um, but yeah, I think getting involved was very important for me um, as it kind of broke me out of my shell. I was that guy in the back of the classroom that I want to talk. Now I'm <laughs> in the front of the classroom talking all the time. So I think breaking out of that shell, all the different anxieties and uh, mental health issues that we all go through and finding those those folks who will be there on the long term to help you um, on your career path in your day to day. So, thank you, Eugene. There's also a hand, a, a question or comment from Professor Kimberly Fowad. Fowad, welcome. Hi, Professor. Fowad. Hi. Yes. Uh, oh, Fowad. Yeah, but you can call me just Kim. Kim is fine. Yeah, so I am. Um, I do teach biology, so I am in STEM. Mm -hmm. And um, I did change careers. Um, I was in healthcare, and then I started teaching. And um, so, yeah, I am in STEM. I'm one of those. <laughs> but um, uh, well, 
I just wanted to ask your experience about, um, I've had several students who um, from the past semesters have approached me and told me, oh yeah, you remind me of my mom. <laughs> like, um, yeah, so sometimes in the classroom, you know, um, when I want to get a point um, across and um, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I tend to be strict about deadlines and things uh, like that. And yeah. um, so I've had several students tell me, oh yeah, you remind me of my Filipino mom. And that then it, it, that, it will, it will, <laughs> and then kind of made me think, okay, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And so sometimes I feel like I have to exert extra effort in making them understand that I may remind you of your mom, your Filipino mom, but, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, I'm not that stern and um, you're welcome to see me in my office hours. And I feel like mm -hmm. I just have to exert extra effort in making them understand that because um, there's that stereotype too of a Filipino mom and being stern mm -hmm. and strict. And um, yes. um, I, I was just wondering That's if you've true. ever experienced that um, being a professor. And um, so, yeah, I just, um, I feel like I just, I I, ha, um, I can't <laughs> step away from that Filipino mom stereotype and being, um, oh yeah. So yeah, I guess I just wanted to ask your experience about that. Um, in my experience, yes, I too go through the same kind of challenges. Um, I think I'm at that age of like, I am the age for that they would be my children, which is crazy. Um, and then at the same time, reflecting upon how I was raised and how my parents treated me and how I didn't necessarily could challenge their authority and all those different things that finding my voice um, and better communication with my parents was key uh, in terms of like um, overcoming that those kind of, I think, how do you explain it? Those practices that were kind of Put upon myself that I don't want to replicate. And I think um, my students, I, the way I approach it is like, I want to meet them halfway or meet them where they're at. Um, and I think that's helpful in terms of understanding their situation, especially during the pandemic. There was a lot of challenges. And I think um, understanding that they are I'm human, they're human. We're going through this thing together um, and not create like this, um, this like hierarchy or I'm the elder, you have to listen to me kind of relationship. Um, I think is a work in progress constantly. Um, I think uh, I've had my moments where I was strict and I've had my moments where I had to be flexible. And I think that's where my students challenged me to become a better teacher. Um, and I hear you. I don't wanna like take the energy of my strict mom, but it happened, comes out once in a while, but uh, it's also coming from a place of love and uh, support. So uh, always kind of understanding that too. Um, and sharing your own experience is important and how you were raised and grown up uh, kind of also humanizes you as a professor. So it, it also bridging that gap that oftentimes is unfortunately there as a, as a culture in higher ed. So those are how I've kind of navigated some of those uncle, auntie, mom, dad kind of dynamics, yeah. Is that helpful? Oh yeah, definitely. That um, just um, that vulnerability in the classroom, definitely. Yeah. And just a funny story for everyone. I had one student um, during lab, um, open labs call me Ate. <laughs> and yeah. I was the professor in charge that day, but that was funny. But anyway, <laughs> definitely Ate auntie, I guess. Thank yeah. you. The Ate thing or the Kuya thing, also important to kind of recognize that cultural kind of association with folks, but then kind of not perpetuating the, the, the hierarchy of that too, is a, always a constant challenge. Yeah, thank you for sharing your experience, Kim, and that great thanks for your response, Eugene. And Professor Winnie also added in the chat there that women of color bear an extra burden of emotional support. And I, I think 
you know, zooming out from the interpersonal interactions we have with each other or in our classroom or out of our classroom or in our departments, I think too, there might be ways as an institution, we can also think about what structures and um, things are in place that can support dispelling and debunking myths and stereotypes about gender, race, mm -hmm. sexual orientation, religion, et cetera, because I think, I think those are great examples that both what Kim and Winnie have shared and, and Eugene, your background and experience too of, of, of how the, the system enables those stereotypes to exist and manifest and the, and, and the students, I mean, we are all susceptible to media influences and the stereotypes that emerge within our different institutions, family, church, school, work. I said media, right? I mean, like <laughs> media is a really big one. Um, and then also recognize too, uh, for a Filipino student who has maybe never had a Filipino faculty advisor or teacher, professor, or interfacing with an administrator who's Filipino, uh can also have also be very powerful and and be a, a way of seeing themselves reflected in, in a way that they haven't before um as well so i think it is it, you, we've helped to kind of come make it complicated <laughs> in some mm -hmm. ways too that that these are also complex relations when we may not see ourselves in in leadership roles like in front of the classroom or um in front of a uh, event etc I think that that's a great, great um, point to raise that the, in good discussion to think of the complexity of our interactions with each other within our own community and outside of our communities. Yes, we do, Dr. Hong. We need affinity and support groups for faculty of color on campus. Yes. Oh, that's important. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The institution. Just like oh. our students do, yeah. Yeah. Well, I realize it's after four. Any other comments, thoughts, uh, final words, um, Professor Eugene, before we close? Uh, final thoughts? Um, appreciative. Thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. I was like coming home, um, coming full circle in terms of me being at Sac City at 1999, um, finding those the sense of community. And I'm glad that the last 20 plus years, the work has continued in different ways and I'm glad to be part of that. Um, and I hope to kind of uh, be a resource for folks. Um, I do live in Vacaville, so I still have my ties to Sacramento. Um, so um, I want, if, I'll put my email here. Um, for folks that want to reach out, um, but yeah, I think, um, let's see, that's my email, and maybe one day I get to see you in person. Yes, um, we'll help make that happen. That would be wonderful. I want to see all the great changes. Yep, we'll invite you back for sure, um, anytime. Now, let me hand it back to um, Raul. Any uh, closing remarks, comments? Thank you so much again, Eugene, and thank you everyone for your engagement and uh, excitement about this topic and our speaker. Thank you, uh, um, uh, Professor uh, uh, Eugene Gumbo, for kicking us off in our first uh, um, three part uh, speaker series. So appreciate your time and salamat. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming in. Um, we do invite you to uh, join us next Friday um, for our next speaker series with. Uh, Dr. Robin Magali, um, Rodriguez, and she'll be talking about um, uh, martial law and also uh, 50 years of Filipino American study um, and how uh, martial law and intergenerational inter inter uh, um, challenges that the face with that. So please come back. Um, we'll send out the, um, the, um, the flyer is in the chat room. So please download it so you can have it and you'll be able to register. Again, thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend. Um, thank you again, uh, Dr. Eugene Gumbel, for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Maraming salamat.